let's take it uh, let's ask, let me ask you a few questions and then let us see whether we are covering that okay how much magnesium is seen in one ampule if i give a magnesium how much magnesium is seen in one ampule 2 gram 2 gram and how much millimoles is that what is written on that magnesium ampule 50% very good 50% mean by volume yes ha ah, okay so so fine magnesium okay uh, how much millimoles you should know that what is the normal magnesium level Our magnesium level, so two If you have a patient with torsada, this is a life-threatening emergency. What will you do? Uh, four grams. I need to uh, give over five to ten minutes. Okay. And if you have a patient of pre-eclampsia, how do you treat them? Uh, what are the manifestations clinically if you look at hypomagnesemia? Next time, ECG check. There's a specific nystagmus that comes in. Not with nystagmus, but that is one of the neurological. What about the rest of clinical manifestations that you get? There are so many clinical manifestations. And Caesar, patient present with Caesar. So, so, so. I, in short, none of us know anything over here. So let's hear Ruchika, okay? Uh, and we'll 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 take it uh, uh, how to manage magnesium, okay? If you are doing magnesium levels, when do you repeat your magnesium levels? That's another question. If the patient is hypomagnesemic, when do you repeat? After how much? Maybe immediately after six hours, after twenty-four hours, after twelve hours. So, so let's uh, hear. Um, good morning, everyone. So today's topic is magnesium. So magnesium is the second most abundant intracellular cation and the fourth most abundant cation in our body. So the distribution of magnesium is like it's uh, uh, adult human has got sixty percent magnesium in the bones, twenty percent in skeletal muscle, and less than one uh, percent in the extracellular fluid, and ninety per nineteen percent in other soft tissues. So that makes it so important. When you say this, this becomes so important. Now what is important? The question I asked you now was uh, uh, when you do magnesium levels uh, and you take magnesium levels immediately after that, uh, you say you get magnesium, and ten minutes later you say let's set a magnesium level. Let's set a magnesium level. Where it will be? It will be in the right. It will be there. So it might show you it's normal, or it might show you it's high. I don't understand it because ninety-nine percent has to get in. When you are deficient, you are not deficient here. You are deficient here. So this is very important for you to understand. When you are deficient, you are not deficient here. You understand? You are deficient here. So if you get hypoglycemia. Means there is extreme deficiency is what you must understand. Okay, when if you get serum magnesium being very low, it means there is a lot of deficiency. It's not it's not normal. Okay, because there is a lot of deficiency that comes in over here, right? Huh? That is the reason that if you want to repeat your magnesium levels, you want to give five six hours before you do it. Okay, at least six hours I want to I want to wait before I repeat my magnesium level because there is a possibility. That uh, you know that this all will go inside and again you see your low levels. You understand me? Clear on this? Huh? That is also the reason. That is also the reason that if you want to replace, you have to replace big amount. That is also the re reason that if you want to replace magnesium, you want to replace in big amounts because you are not resuscitating magnesium here. You are resuscitating magnesium right here. So you can't give one gram magnesium and say fine. Are you understanding? Uh, I want to give high amount of magnesium if I find that there is real hypomagnesemia along with clinical manifestations. Clear? Clear on this? Clear on this? Uh, what is the role of magnesium? Then why is magnesium such an important uh, cation in our body? 
So there's lots of physiological functions like, like in enzymes, like in enzymes, what are, what are the enzymes uh, which are magnesium dependent? So uh, there is uh, direct enzyme activation that is phospho or fructokinase, creatine kinase, uh, adenine cyclase, uh, and sodium potassium nucleophase from calcium antagonist, membrane functions, and structural functions of proteins, nucleic acids, etc. Then uh, regulation of magnesium. So magnesium as such is not uh, regulated by any particular uh, uh, pump or anything. It itself is like if there is if the levels of magnesium in the blood reduces, so then the renal absorption of magnesium increases. In case if it's increasing, then that reduces. So it's basically a homeostasis which is maintained in the body for magnesium ion. So it begins in the GI tract where orally consumed magnesium is absorbed and a process which appears to be dependent upon passive diffusion from the GI lumen through the tight junctions between the epithelial cells. It's like it's self-regulatory. There's no uh, specific uh, uh, ion or channel which is present for the uh, magnesium regulation in our body. So then the normal magnesium levels are between 1.46 to 2.68 mg per deciliter. So hypomagnesium it, uh, uh, it occurs when the magnesium level goes beyond uh, below 1.46. So now what are the, there are various causes which cause uh, decreased levels of magnesium. So what are they? It could be because of uh, starvation, it could be because of alcohol use in critically ill patients. Then it can be secondary uh, to certain medications that is lupin, thyroid diuretics, proton pump inhibitors, aminoglycosides, amphotericin, digitalis, uh, then chemotherapeutic agents, uh, then it can be because of acute diarrhea, chronic diarrhea, acute pancreatitis, gastric bypass surgery, inherited tubular disorders, and other uh, rare genetical uh, disorders. So pathophysiology. So magnesium is a cofactor and it, uh, uh, in many biological reactions, it has a direct effect on various other electrolytes including sodium, calcium, and potassium. So it, uh, the homeostasis involves the kidney, uh, primarily through the proximal tubule, take ascending loop of MA and distal tubule, small bubble that is primarily to the jejunum and helium and bone. So hypomagnesium occurs when uh, something, whether a drug or a disease condition, alters the homeostasis of magnesium. Magnesium deficiency can cause hypocalcemia or uh, decreased magnesium causes impaired magnesium uh, dependent adrenal cyclase generation and which decreases the release of uh, parathyroid hormone. In turn, calcium levels are also decreased. So if, if there is hypomagnesium, then there is a clear cut possibility that the other, uh, uh, like other ions in our body, like sodium, potassium or calcium, may also vary. No, so importantly, it's the calcium. Calcium. Importantly, it's the calcium, not, you don't tell the rest. So the corollary to that is, if the patient has got magnesium deficiency from a diuretic induced cause, then there is a possibility of the potassium and the magnesium to go low. All right, but but if you have a magnesium that is coming low on its own, uh, there is a very high chance. For example, the patient had diarrhea. Mm -hmm. If the patient has diarrhea, extreme, extreme diarrhea, and he's passed a large amount of magnesium out because that is very common in the ICU. You will have patients with diarrhea very common in the ICU. Those patients can have a uh, reduction in calcium, and that reduction in calcium can be also disastrous. Okay. Then what are the symptoms that we see when the magnesium levels are on the lower side? So neuromuscular manifestations are present, tremors are there, tetany is there, uh, seizures are there, vertical nystagmus, apathy, delirium, coma, cardiovascular manifestations. So uh, when we, uh, when there are ECG changes which includes there is widening of QRS complex, there is peak T waves, prolongation of PR inter uh, interval, atrial and ventricular premature systole, spindrelation, ventricular arrhythmias, including tonsillitis, cardiac ischemia, cardiomyopathy, CCF. So now, uh, magnesium has got very uh, wide uh, uh, sort of uh, this on the cardiac functions of our body. So there are various manifestations that can be seen, so for example, in hypertension. So hypertension is a complex multifactorial heterogeneous disorder for which the exact etiology has uh, yet to be elucidated like what happens. So clinical and experimental trials have suggested that magnesium may play a role in pathogenesis of hypertension by affecting the atrial smooth muscle contraction. Magnesium is found mainly at the inner surface of the cell membrane. Therefore, it plays a role in cell membrane of permeability for calcium and sodium. Magnesium activates the sodium potassium ATPase pump, which plays a major role in regulating sodium and potassium transport. 
by moving potassium into the cells and sodium out of the cells. So alteration in the vascular membrane mag magnesium can result in leaky arterial and arterial membranes, thus contributing to the intracellular reduction of potassium and the gain of calcium and sodium. So this can lead to hypertension, vasospasm, as well as poten uh, potentiation of vasoconstrictor agents. Then in CCF, what happens is magnesium de uh, deficiency is commonly found in patients with congestive heart failure due to various mechanisms. So patients with uh, congestive heart failure may have an increased excretion of uh, magnesium. Secondly, to decreased tubular absorption of magnesium as a result of increased extracellular volume and the effects of secondary hyperaldosteronism uh, found in heart failure. So medications such as diuret, uh, diuretics and digoxin can also worsen the problem and decrease the tubular reabsorption of magnesium. So hyperactive renin angiotensin uh, system may further elevate the aldosterone levels in the body and uh, it exaggerates the state of magnesium deficiency. Also, norepinephrine in a uh, state of heart failure has been shown to reduce magnesium through increased fatty acid. Adding to the vicious cycle, magnesium defi deficiency may worsen hyperaldosteronism which may lead to fluid retention. Sudden cardiac death. So magnesium likely predisposes to sudden cardiac death through several mechanisms. First, magnesium deficiency will sensitize the myocardium to toxin effects of various drugs as well as to hypoxia. Therefore, magnesium supplements may have significant cardioprotective effects. Second, magnesium activates the pump that, that I told, sodium lipase pump, which may be inhibited by the non glucose fuels such as lactate and free fatty acid in the setting of ischemia. Third, deficiency may also lead to chronic uh, electrical instability of the myocardium by affecting the sodium and calcium flow into the cells. There are fourth mechanism which is seen is via the effect of hypomagnesemia on vascular tone. So what happens in that is, in some experiments it was shown that uh, extra uh, cellular magnesium ions have been found to exert a profound beneficial influence on the contractility and uh, reactivations of the arteries and veins from a number of regional vasculatures. So hypomagnesemia has been observed to increase the contractility activity of variety of neurohormonal substances to potentiate vasospasm, likely by controlling the entry and distribution of calcium. So magnesium activates the adenosine triphosphate which is essential for cell membrane functioning and energy source for, uh, for sodium potassium pump. So decreased magnesium decreases the activity of this pump leading to intracellular accumulation of sodium that alters the membrane potential as a result causes cardiac arrhythmia. So how does it cause cardiac arrhythmia? Basically by affecting the sodium potassium pump. So it prevents potassium loss by modulating the potassium proton exchange and intracellular depletion of magnesium causes increase in intracellular uh, sodium and calcium that predispose to vasospasm, increase catecholamine release, increase fatty acid and intravascular hypercoagulability. Also increase in the inflammatory markers results in changes in lipoprotein metabolism, endothelial dysfunction, thrombosis and hypertension. So now uh, what is the uh, role of magnesium? So in uh, uh, smooth muscle cells, we saw it for increases, uh, decreases the peripheral vascular resistance, increases vasodilatation, it's a calcium antagonism. Then in endothelium, it has the following uh, functions of decreased platelet adhesion. Then in heart, uh, what does it do is, um, there is, uh, it uh, decreases coronary, uh, coronary artery spasm, of it uh, doesn't uh, protect from oxidative uh, damage, anti-arrhythmic uh, anti effects is, decreases automaticity. Then um, how, how like magnesium, one of the most common arrhythmia uh, that is present with uh, magnesium deficiency is prostatitis. So exactly what happens is, uh, so uh, magnesium basically, so there is an increase in intracellular potassium current that we uh, saw what it about happens. So there is an increase in uh, intracellular potassium current and decrease net depolarization current. So that causes early after depolarizations and triggered automaticity and then unidirectional block and the intramural re-entry current which causes this torsadis that is increased dispersion of intracardiac depolarization. So now what are the other electrolyte and hormonal imbalances uh, that we see with magnesium? So hypocalcemia, hypokalemia and hypopathic. So evaluation, so evaluation of magnesium, how, uh, we do serum magnesium, phosphate, calcium levels, basic metabolic panel including serum, creatine, kidney functions, glucose levels and ECG. So if unsure the distinction between gastrointestinal losses and renal losses, it can be made by measuring the 24 hour urinary magnesium 
fixation. Management treatment of patients with hypomagnesemia is based on patients' kidney functions, severity of symptoms, and their hemodynamic stability. So if a patient is hemodynamically unstable in an acute hospital setting, 1 to 2 grams of magnesium sulfate can be given in 15 minutes. For symptomatic patients, we give 1 to 2 grams of MgSO4 and uh, if it is given over 1 hour. Non-emergent preparation of the adult uh, patient is uh, generally 4 to 8 grams of magnesium sulfate given over 12 to 24 hours. In pediatric patient, the dose is between 20 to 50 mg per kg with a maximum of 2 grams. So now, uh, how do we treat hypomagnesemia? So, uh, general guidelines of therapies, if ECG changes or symptoms are uh, present, then uh, begin IV replacement, that is 1 to 2 gram MgSO4, that is 1 gram has got 96 mg of elemental magnesium, that is 8 mg equivalence of um, magnesium, over 15 minutes, followed by infusion of 6, uh, 6 grams in 1 liter fluid over 24 hours. And continuous infusion may be required for 3 to 7 days to replenish total body stores and we uh, follow magnesium for every uh, 24 hours and adjust infusion to maintain the levels below 2.5 uh, mg per, uh, per liter. We check for deep tendon reflexes to, de uh, to uh, detect if there is increased levels of magnesium. Then if asymptomatic and there are no ECG changes, then for mild uh, hypomagnesemia, we give 250 uh, 240 mg of uh, per oral elemental uh, magnesium in divided doses. For severe cases, we, give seven, we can give up to 720. And if uh, per oral is not possible or diarrhea is present, then 2 to 6 gram IV infusion over, uh, IV infusion at 1 gram per hour or less. Then for chronic uh, from renal wasting, consider high doses of uh, amyloid. Then, uh, then differential diagnosis. So to check for other electrolyte abnormalities when suspecting or treating hypomagnesemia, low levels of magnesium can cause uh, low levels of calcium as well as potassium. Now what are the complications that we see when we have hypomagnesemia? So uh, it can cause fatal cardiac arrhythmia that we saw such as torsades and in patients with acute MI, it puts them at higher risk of ventricular arrhythmias within the first 24 hours. So it's very important in patients who come to us with MI to keep their magnesium levels uh, normal. Then hypermagnesemia. So there's an electrolyte disturbance which occurs when the magnesium levels go beyond 2.68 mg per decimal. So before we go into this, let's just touch upon hypermagnesemia since they everything. So you have... Um, so you, you elegantly say that 1 gram is equal to 8 milligrams. That is what everybody should understand. That was the first question that we asked. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing that we asked was uh, how often do you repeat levels? Now that you know that 1% is there, mm -hmm. only 1% is, is going to be there. Uh, now, why is it so difficult to replete magnesium? It's also the fact that much of the magnesium, you know, the cells, it is very difficult for the cells to absorb magnesium. Unfortunately, unlike potassium, unlike calcium, Magnesium is an iron that is very difficult to be absorbed. So most of the magnesium ends up in the urine. Most of the magnesium that you are giving ends up in the urine. Are you understanding what I am saying? Unlike potassium, potassium you give it will get absorbed into the cell. You give uh, calcium it will get absorbed into the cell. Magnesium for some reason is not uh, easily absorbed by the cell. And since it is not absorbed in the cell, much of the magnesium gets across in the urine. That is the reason that a uh, one time magnesium may not work. That is the reason that a small dose magnesium may not work. How much is getting excreted, you and me don't know. Mm -hmm. That is the reason that every 6 hours it makes sense to actually send the magnesium for at least 24 hours. Okay, because if you have a magnesium deficiency, give that magnesium. Okay, and 6 hours later, see what it is, what it is doing. It, it may not, even 6 hours, if you find that the magnesium has become normal, Repeat again after 6 hours because you don't, don't know this magnesium would have get caught into the cells and, and probably the level that you seek is not right. You got the point. For 24 hours, once you diagnose hypomagnesemia, for 24 hours, do 6 hourly magnesium sulfates. Clear? Huh? Because, you, as I told you once more, that if magnesium is getting into the body, it is getting excreted through the urine. How much is getting absorbed, we don't know. Unlike potassium, unlike others, you know, which we see a characteristic rise. Clear? Huh? Now, two, uh, two things over here. When you have hypercalcemia and hyperparathyroidism, 
ओके हाइपर कैल्सियमिया एंड हाइपर ब्लड हाइपर पैथोरिज्म हाइपर कैल्सियमिया एंड हाइपो हाइपर फॉस्फेटेमिया दिस कम्स टुगेदर व्हेन ऑल ऑफ दीस थिंग्स अकर देयर इज गोइंग टू बी अ ड्रॉप इन द मैग्नीशियम एंड द एंड द ड्रॉप इन द मैग्नीशियम विल कॉज अ ड्रॉप इन द कैल्शियम द ड्रॉप इन द मैग्नीशियम विल कॉज अ ड्रॉप इन द कैल्शियम एंड अ ड्रॉप इन द पोटेशियम क्लियर ha huh? if there is hypercalcemia that means if you get a calcium level that is high don't stop there do a magnesium level quickly okay ha huh? that a uh, drop in magnesium it will also cause a commensurate drop in potassium ha huh? and also a drop in hypocalcemia ha uh, clear it will cause hypercalcemia will cause hypocalcemia because of hypomagnesemia so when you have hypomagnesemia The, it is not the magnesium that is usually causing the arrhythmia. It is actually the drop in the potassium that is combined with hypomagnesium that is causing the drop in that is causing the the, the uh, problems that is with magnesium. Now with the uh, arrhythmia, right? Huh? So in the in the manifestation that you may get. So this means to say that almost almost uh, a good proportion of patients in your ICU are going to have hypomagnesemia. A good proportion. Why they want to be having hypomagnesemia? Because many of them are on diuretics. Many of them are on uh, on medicines like amphotericin, amanoglycosides, and things like that. Many of them have diarrhea. Are you understanding? So if you look at the patient, many of them have got bowel and bladder abnormalities. Many of them are not absorbing. Are you understanding? So what you are seeing there may not be the right thing at all. It may be the bone, the internal organs are lost their magnesium. So, if you pick up a hypomagnesemia, it becomes very, very important for you. So, am I right? So, the subtle way of doing these things is by actually looking at neurological manifestations, of which one of the important things is hyperreflexia, reflexes. Okay, reflexes and tremors, reflexes and tremors. When we say nystagmus, how is this nystagmus? You know, this nystagmus is classically is a downbeat nystagmus. Uh, she just said downbeat nystagmus means what? You you take the patient. You take the patient. Look down. It will go down. This will occur. Okay, it will go like this. Down beat this time. So you take the patient up. You will not see it. You take the eyeball up. You will not see it. Take the eyeball down. You will see that this time is. Okay, you will see that vertical this time is that occurs. Okay, clear of this. Huh? Down beat this time is. Huh? You will see that this. When you go down only, you see that this time is that is coming. Clear? Huh? That is down beat this time is that you will probably see. And and we are replacing this magnesium. That is the reason that if you have a uh, very few contraindications with magnesium, what are the contraindications? And I call for that matter related contraindications. One is if there is extreme renal failure. If the so you understood now why renal failure becomes a contraindication, becomes a kind of a related contraindication because of the fact that when you are giving magnesium, where is the magnesium maximally going from? Urine. Urine. Now when the kidneys are not working, this magnesium will not go. You will not know what is going to happen. You are understanding. So, in in the case of uh, documented hypomagnesemia with renal failure, uh, the commonest cause is going to be dialysis or CRT. There, okay, commonest cause will be dialysis. In that case, you may not want to give two grams and four grams that that she mentioned. You probably want to give a gram and then repeat and see if you have documented hypomagnesemia. Because in that case, that one gram would probably cause a very high amount because it is not excreting. It may not be excreting out of the urine. So that is very different from potassium, very different from many of these things that we are talking about. Okay, clear? Huh? So, it is, so that explains about the one of the contrary. Second contrary indication is my senior gravis. Okay, you don't want to interfere with the neuromuscular excitability at that time. If you want to give it, I will not. So rest everywhere else, excepting the attribute is less than 30 and my senior gravis. Rest everywhere else. I want to give magnesium as an infusion if I find hypomagnesium. You understand, na? Why I want to give it as an infusion? Because say I give a bolus and give a repeat bolus and I give a repeat bolus, all that is going to go from the urine. Absorption in urine. You give four gram, four gram, four gram every two hours. There is no absorption happening because all of that is going to just go out from the urine because it's, I, as I told you, uh, it, the urine will get formed. Urine is anyways forming. That urine will take that magnesium out. Are you understanding? Because cell is not absorbing it. That is why for the cell to absorb, give it time. So, for all patients who you document hypomagnesemia, it is essential to use a infusion. You understanding? Clear of this? You understood the principle behind using an infusion? Yes, sir. Huh? Because if you if you give bolus, it will just get excreted out. 
So if I want to give an infusion, how do I do that? I give 4 grams over an hour and then give 1 gram an hour till and every 6 hours repeat my completion. Okay, this is the, this is the dose that we even use for three grams here. 4 grams and 1 gram an hour. Clear? Am I clear on this? Huh? So this, this comes to the very important question of atrial fibrillation. Okay, what happens in atrial fibrillation? I mean, this is one place where you would probably want to think of magnesium. Okay, I should say there is a large number of elements of magnesium that causes, uh, that is responsible for maintaining the heart and its functions. There is a lot of things, ADPs and stuff like that. And when you have arrhythmia and you have potassium on the lower side, uh, you can assume uh, reasonably well that you need to keep the magnesium off. You want to keep the magnesium on the higher level. Yes, I will send the magnesium, but I can start magnesium as treatment like cardron. I can actually start magnesium as treatment. Are you understanding? Huh? For, for atrial fibrillation. Though it might not convert, it might hold the... Because there is a good amount of leverage when you have urine, no? Uh, good urine. There is good amount of leverage. Toxicity, less chances. It needs 4 to 5 times the amount of normal levels to get toxicity. Okay. So, two point, uh, if, if it is 2.4 or 2.5 is your milligram per dl is your normal, you will need 5 or 7 milligrams per dl to actually cause toxicity. That is too much high. Now, if you understand that to replete them, it is so difficult. To cause toxicity is even more difficult. You are understanding what I am saying? Uh, to replete that magnesium, it is so difficult. To create toxicity is even more difficult. Uh, you got the point what I am telling you. Huh? So, that is why don't be afraid. You start magnesium on atrial fibrillation, you are not doing anything wrong. You are helping the heart only. Okay, so if you give uh, 4 grams of magnesium upfront for around 2 hours and 1 gram per hour, Okay, uh, it is known that the patient, if he converts, remain in conversion for a longer period of time. Uh, the success of a cardioversion is much better. That is, you want to cardiovert your patients, the success is much better. So, if you have a patient with atrial fibrillation, you want to cardiovert. I want to give magnesium, say, for some time. I want to give potassium for some time. Uh, get the potassium to 4.5, give the magnesium to higher levels. Okay, it will probably help cardioversion success will be much higher. You may also reduce the heart rate by around 15 beats per minute. You might reduce the heart rate by 50. So if it's 120, you might reduce it to 100. Okay, uh, so that may also occur. And that might also help these particular patients. So it does cause some rhythm conversion. It may cause some rhythm conversion. Head to head with cardioversion. With, see, compared to a drug like cardrone, compared to a drug like cardrone, this magnesium is much less toxic compared to cardrone. Cardrone is a toxic drug. Okay, compared to that, magnesium is, is, is much more better. Similarly, if you have just mild hypomagnesemia, you may get away by giving oral magnesium. But you must also understand that here the dose will be again very high. If you are giving IV 24 grams in a day, 240 milligrams that you mentioned will be of no use. How much are you giving? 24 grams you are giving. And what did you mention is a dose that is 240 milligrams, which is too small a dose. I would, I, if it is severe uh, mild hypomagnesemia, I can give maybe 400 3 times in a day, not 240, but it is too low. Okay, so we'll probably give 400 milligrams if it's hypomagnesemia. You understand? 400 milligrams. So if I have a patient of alcoholism who classically has hypomagnesemia, okay, a, a patient of alcoholism who classically have hypomagnesemia, they normally have hypomagnesemia. Okay, and I diagnose hypomagnesemia in these patients. It is very essential that I repeat them in a good amount. I repeat them in a very very good amount. Clear on that? Uh, on that you can't give orally at that time. They are not going to absorb it. You understand? So if you have a patient of diarrhea, mild hypomagnesemia, I cannot give it orally, it's not absorbing anything, it's a diarrhea. It's not going to work. Uh, are you understanding? Huh? So if you want to give magnesium, it has to be on a higher doses. So if the, in, in ICU specifically, if you get mild hypomagnesemia, it has to be IV only. Uh, because I have, the ICU patient has got a high chance of having problems otherwise. Clear? Huh? So when it comes to torsad, torsad is one place where uh, it's life threatening. Torsad is one place where it can be life threatening. Okay, Tulsar uh, is, is basically the heart rate moving in a wide QRS complex around a certain axis. Okay, so this is one of the, uh, one of the uh, prime treatments for Tulsar is giving magnesium. So in this case, I will give magnesium, you give 4 gram as a bolus over 5 to 10 minutes. Okay, you give 4 grams as a bolus. This is the only place where you give 4 grams as a bolus over 5 to 10 minutes. The rest everywhere you will probably be giving uh, over an hour or two. Okay, so 4 grams as a bolus over 5 to 10 minutes uh, and then follow 5 to 20 minutes and then follow it up with an infusion of 1 gram per hour. 
Okay, so this is the only place where magnesium sulfate is given as a bolus. Rest everywhere we are giving magnesium over one hour or for two hours. Clear? So torsoid is the only place where we are going to give magnesium as a bolus. Clear? Uh, so when you get a magnesium ampule in your hand, you should be able to tell weight by volume what is happening. One gram is four millimoles or eight millimoles. You should be able to see all those things very clearly. Okay, when you have this magnesium ampule in your hand. Uh, 1 gram is equal to 4 is equal to 8 millipoles. So th there is a small difference even in the units. So whenever you are looking at the, whenever you are seeing your units in the laboratory, what is your normal limit you should write. You should see on that what is your normal limit. Is it a millipoles, is it a milligrams, is it a millipoles. All three are different. Clear? Now let's go to hypermagnesium.
acute asthma exacerbation torsadus and uh, copolytic to prevent uh, preterm labor. So, these are the things for your. Yeah, so, uh, uh, I think what is very important. Yeah. So, magnesium sulfate can uh, be administered intramuscularly, orally, intraosseous, or intravenous. So, for every 1 gram of magnesium sulfate, it contains 98.6 mg or 8.12 mg equivalent of elemental magnesium. So, magnesium sulfate can be combined with 5% dextrose of water to make intravenous solution. So, orally, it is available as a capsule of powder which can be combined with water to form an oral solution. Intramuscular diluted, it can be administered to women, children, and adults. Intraosseous, it can be administered to an adequately Place intravenous or if no access is available, and intravenous can be administered as an IV push dose infusion or an addit additive to TPN. Now, what are the adverse effects that we see when we give MG suppose? So, minor facial flushing with warm with the administration, however, symptoms typically result spontaneous. If patients with neuromuscular disease, such as in myasthenia gravis, the neuromuscular function may worsen at lower concentration of the medication. If, even, uh, if it is given rapidly in or in high doses, patients may ex experience transient hypotension due to smooth muscle inhibition causing a vasodilatory effect, but that will also result. The patient is on continuous infusion. So, serum levels must be accounted for as uh, symptoms related to hypomagnesemia can become clinically evident. At uh, supra therapeutic serum concentration, absent reflexes, uh, abnormal cardiac conduction, and muscle weakness can also occur. Now, what are the contraindications to give MGSO4? So, if there is any known hypersensitivity reaction, if the patient is a known uh, case of heart block, as it may exaggerate the already slowed cardiac conduction, withholding magnesium sulfate infusion in patients with preeclampsia 2 hours before fetal delivery, and if the patient is of uh, like renal failure, renal insufficiency. Now, monitoring. So, magnesium level should be checked every 6 to 8 hours or clinically by checking the uh, patella reflexes or urinary output. Normal serum levels are 0.7 to 1 millimoles per liter, that is 1 to 4 milli equivalent per liter. Therapeutic levels in PA clamisha should be 2 to 3.5. Patella reflexes are lost when it's between 4 to 5. And respiratory depression, as we saw, saw 10 to 15 uh, milli equivalents per liter, then paralysis when it goes beyond 15. So what we see very important before we know is that there is a huge, huge amount of you know, as you know, there is a huge amount of uh, leeway before the magnesium toxicity comes in. This is what you must understand. There is a huge amount of leeway. Now to remember hypermagnesemia, it's not difficult. It is just the opposite of hypermagnesemia. So what happens in what happens in hypermagnesemia clinically, you will not you will see the opposite of that. So if you get reflexes. If you get reflexes, then it is uh, it is not hypermagnesemia at all. You know, if you get reflexes, it is not hypermagnesemia because hypermagnesemia to get to uh, reflexes loss you need at least four times the millimoles. You understand? So it is not possible that if you are getting uh, uh, reflexes, that this is hypermagnesemia. This is something else. Okay. Uh, now the problem with hypermagnesemia is it very it looks very similar to hypokalemia. Hyperkalemia, sorry, it looks very similar to hyperkalemia. You have tall thick T waves, you have wide QRS complex. You understand? You have wide QRS complex. In ECG wise, it looks the same. The hyperkalemia, you get bradycardia hypotension, here you get bradycardia hypotension in hypermagnesemia. But here, the clinching diagnosis is always the history of clinical examination. In hyperkalemia, uh, you know, you have a history of CKD, your patient is taking KCL, patient is not, you know, you have generally a CKD or renal failure. When you have that bradycardia hypotension that you normally see. Uh, some drugs that is taken. But here, the classical issue would be I have given drug, I have given magnesium sulfate. The classical issue will be I am giving I am on magnesium for adenia, I am on magnesium for preeclampsia. Mm -hmm. uh, and because of that, or I am a renal failure patient who's taken any mass and laxatives. Mm -hmm. Or a renal failure patient that has taken any mass and laxatives. So many times you have if you have a renal failure patient that comes in, patient has wide complex, patient has block, hard block, but the potassiums are normal, the magnesiums may be the cause. Because what happens, the renal failure patients, they are being dialyzed. Since they are being dialyzed, their urine, their, body, their, their stools are hard. They are generally taking laxatives. They are generally taking even enemas. So these enemas, like proctoclases enemas, like laxatives that contain magnesium, causes hypermagnesemia because here there is no urine. 
what I am saying. So when you have a patient who is on, uh, uh, who is on, you, you understood the entire path when I started with, if there is low, uh, if the magnesium you are giving also, cast and you magnesium maximum? Urine. Now the patient has no urine here. In that, for him, even a small amount of magnesium can be extremely toxic. Are you understanding? It can be extremely toxic. That's why when you have a patient of renal failure and you have wild complex URS uh, bradycardia or you have heart blocks, a magnesium level has to be set. It has to be said if the potassiums are normal, otherwise also a magnesium level has to be said. Okay, you understood now why. Okay, because in that case, you would have just taken some kind of, uh, uh, some kind of uh, laxative or you might give on a positive or an enema which will basically cause the magnesiums to go uh, very, very high. Clear? Uh, now, uh, the other reasons why you can have magnesium is where is magnesium maximum inside? Inside the bones, bones and cells. Bones. It's in the cells and the bones. So if your cell lysis, you will have hypermagnesium. If you send lysis, you have so tumor lysis syndrome, rhabdomyolysis, you know, all these kinds of situations where cell is breaking down, hemolytic uremic syndrome, you will have the uh, you will have the magnesium going on. Clear? You will have the magnesium going on. Clear on this? Anything where the cell is lysing, you will have magnesium going on. So these are the other indications: tumor lysis syndrome, rhabdomyolysis, where you will probably see hyper magnesium. Clear? Huh? Clear on this? The, uh, the only thing that is different in the in the man is here is you don't have too many symptoms. You have only a cardiac manifestation and you have reflexes. This is all two things because beyond that, patients will have respiratory depression and arrest. There is no mental status that is getting altered here. You understand? Huh? This is just this and this that is occurring. Clear? Uh, and in this bargain, the, the fastest thing that you can do is dialysis to get them out of this problem. Uh, if he is getting into a situation, the fastest thing, but in that time, give 20 grams of calcium, 20 cc of calcium gluconate, 20 to 30 cc of calcium gluconate over 5 to 10 minutes, that will probably take care of you for a while. Clear? Hmm? Clear about uh, the uh, manifestations of hypermagnesemia? Clear about what causes hypermagnesemia and why is it different from, and it is just the opposite of hypomagnesemia, it's just the opposite. Whatever happens, I'm, see, there you have cerebellar symptoms which cause ataxia, a little altered bit. This time, this you had uh, cerebellar symptoms uh, that was there in hypo uh, magnesemia. Whereas here, you are basically just looking at reflexes. Okay, just looking at reflexes and you're looking at levels that come in. Now, you understood why every four to six hours is what you want to do this. Okay, because it's going to take a while before that also. So, even when you're correcting that also, four to six hours you correct it, you see it again. What is that? Clear? Huh? So, generally, magnesium. Uh, because hypermagnesemia, you are generally doing an hydrogenic problem, and then it is tumor lysis or hydromagnesis. Clear? Uh, any doubts on this? Any doubts? Phosphates. Okay, it is interlinked. All that is interlinked. Huh? Uh, and many of these animals also contain magnesium. Magnesium being a laxative, magnesium being a laxative, it might also it, it is known to cause this osmosis. And that's the reason that uh, uh, it may cause magnesium trisilicate, magnesium milk of magnesium is a laxative. Mm -hmm. So, the muffins will have you know, milk of magnesium. So, if you have a patient of renal failure, don't try to put them on all these things. It doesn't make sense now. You're understanding? Huh? It doesn't make sense to actually give milk of magnesium to a patient who is of, uh, of renal failure. Now, you understood why. You understood why. Huh? So, if you have hypokalemia, uh, the dictum is give magnesium along with it. Uh, because if there is a cause for hypokalemia, that cause will also cause hypomagnesemia. You are understanding? That is the reason that when you have hypokalemia, we are adding magnesium along with it. Okay, it is prudent for you to go to lower magnesium levels to understand whether this patient is having uh, severe hypomagnesemia. Because severe hypomagnesemia will not give this one gram amount. You will have to give much higher doses. Clear? Hmm? Stop.